According to CIA, Mexican cartels are in control of the 20% of the entire Mexico. So how come these guys get so powerful to control the real land territory in Mexico? We're going to dive into that and in order to dive into that and understand how the cartels got bigger like this, we're going to be uh, looking at Guadalajara cartel from which uh, cartels like Sinaloa, Tirana or Juarez stem from. So we're going to be looking at Guadalajara cartel and the important name, the key person of this cartel, the founder Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's roll. Between 1960s and the 70s, the US's main priority in war against drugs was Mariana. Especially popular among Vietnam vets, Mariana trafficking was targeted by President Nixon and after Mariana trafficking got damaged, there was a need for a new drug on the streets. Coca trees create the main component for this new drug, cocaine, which grew mostly in South American countries like Bolivia, Peru and Colombia. So in the beginning, Colombian cartels were both producing and trafficking cocaine alone, carrying it all the way to the United States. However, after the US maintained strong control over trafficking routes and Pablo Escobar declared war on the government, it became impossible for Colombian cartels to carry their cocaine via these traditional routes. The ocean and the sky were no more available for them to carry their coke, Therefore, the rival cartels of Colombia, Medellin and Cali, decided to carry their products to the US via Mexico. There are two important names in this new decision about Mexico who made such a shift possible. One of them is the man who united different Mexican smuggling groups under one flag, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. Born in January 6, 1946, Felix Gallardo was born in the suburbs of the capital city of Sinaloa state, Culiacan. Since 1950s, Sinaloa was heavily involved in marijuana production and trafficking. And Felix Gallardo, who became a police officer, became a bodyguard for Sinaloa governor Leopoldo Sanchez Celis. And Celis was a member of the PRI party, which had been ruling Mexico since 1929 and allowed drug trafficking and also was involved in it. Therefore, by such connections, Felix Gallardo had become a part of a corrupted system and joined the organization of the local godfather, Pedro Aviles Perez, also known as El Leon de la Sierra, the mountain lion. Since 1960s, Perez was a strongman of Sinaloa and one of the first generation Mariana smugglers of Mexico. So even before the coke was a thing for Mexicans, these guys were already pushing their Mariana into the US soil. And the common belief was that Aviles Perez was the first Mexican smuggler to smuggle drugs into the US via planes. Felix Gallardo used this political connection to enhance Perez's Mariana smuggling network. But Perez got killed in April 15, 1978 during a shootout with Mexican police. And according to many sources, he was set up by his own lieutenants. But anyways, after his demise, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo became the boss of the Sinaloa organization. The main lieutenants of this group was Ernesto Fonseco Carrillo, aka Don Neto, Juan Manuel Salcido Uzeta, aka El Cochiloco, Juan Jose Quintero, Pablo Acosta Villarreal, and Juan Jose Esparagoza, aka El Azul, who was a member of the Mexico's federal police. Don Neto was one of the old guard and a partner of Perez Aviles, the former boss. The crazy pig, El Cochiloco, was in charge of the warehouses. Below these lieutenants were the rising stars of the Sinaloa. Neto's nephew, Amado Correo Fuentes, who was to become a rock star of Mexican underworld in the future. 
Rafael Caro Quintero and Ismael Zambada, aka El Mayo. And below these were the people who were not necessarily the most important members at this time. The notorious El Chapo Guzman, Hector Palma, Ariana Felix brothers, and finally the Beltran Levia brothers. These were the people on the streets at this time while Felix Gallardo was running the things from the top. Around this time the Mexican drug trafficking was controlled by two main groups. The Gulf Cartel that controlled the Gulf of Mexico, the Northeast, and the other group was from the West, Sinaloa, which would be called in the future Guadalajara Cartel. Almost every member of Felix Gallardo's group were originally from Sinaloa, but the organization was later based itself in Guadalajara, the rich city of Jalisco State instead of Sinaloa. There were two reasons for that, Operation Condor and the investments Guadalajara took in the beginning of the 80s. Briefly, Operation Condor was a CIA operation that began in 1968 and the operation mainly targeted the communist organizations in the South America and supported the right-wing dictators for the countries of this region. Tens of thousands of people got imprisoned, tortured and murdered as a result of Operation Condor and the Mexican part of the operation was targeting mainly the Mariana smugglers. The operation mainly focused on the Golden Triangle of Mexico, the region that was in between Sinaloa, Chihuahua and Durango states. The triangle was hosting almost 20,000 farmers who produced more than 70% of the Mariana and opium that were sold in the United States. This operation began in 1976 and destroyed 72,000 poppy fields, a territory that is comprised of 15,000 acres and more than 11,000 fields of Mariana. Overall, the Army and the Air Force of Mexico destroyed almost 3.5 thousand fields full of poppies and almost 15,000 acres of land full of 20,000 Mariana fields. And all the while these things were happening in poor Sinaloan suburbs, Guadalajara had rich hotels, restaurants, mass housing projects, currency exchange offices, and many different trade organizations and businesses. So these aspects of Guadalajara made the city a center of attraction which was close to Sinaloa. And the Sinaloan smugglers who were targeted by the operations decided to make Guadalajara their new base of operations. Once easily targeted by the air force in open fields, now they were able to hide among the gleam and tall buildings of this rich city. And meanwhile, the Colombian cartels were in a tough situation since their Florida and Caribbean trafficking routes were under American invasion. So basically they're looking for a new partner to smuggle their cocaine. And the Honduran trafficker, who was called El Negro due to his dark skin, Juan Mata Ballesteros, reached out to Felix Gallardo at this point. Formerly arrested for entering the US illegally, smuggling cocaine in Mexico and allegedly for murder, El Negro had become an effective figure in the underworld. Furthermore, he found a commercial airline company called Setco, which carried the weapons and aid that CIA sent to counter guerrilla operations in Latin America. El Negro Mata got in touch with Felix Gallardo in 1977 on the behalf of Medellin cartel led by Pablo Escobar. After this, one of the Medellin lieutenants, Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha, aka El Mexicano due to his keen interest in Mexican culture, met Gallardo. And thus, it was decided that the South American cocaine was to be smuggled into the US via Mexico. And this was an offer that Mexican smugglers could not refuse, because the margin of the profit of cocaine was way higher than Mariana. When you think about it, Mariana was grown in Mexico, so you can think that it was relatively more preferable for Mexicans for they'd be able to control the whole process, but growing Mariana was a demanding business. Because Mariana was grown in places that were far away from residential areas and also away from law enforcement's reach. These were mountainous regions of Mexico, but these places were problematic regarding the harvesting yield. Plus the whole transportation cost from these faraway regions to more central places was adding up to the expenses, further decreasing the margin of profit. But the Sinaloans first tried to solve this problem by bringing in a new plant from Oregon and California which was called Sinsemia, a seedless cannabis that did not get fertilized, rather using that energy to increase the psychoactive effect which meant higher market value. Yet Sinsemia was grown in the deserts, the places that needed wells for irrigation, which is hard to drill due to Mexico's legislations about wells. Also the fields in the desert were easier targets for aerial surveillance. 
Especially this became a phenomenon after the DAA agent Kiki Camarena started to talk to peasants who worked in the fields to cooperate with DAA. Camarena made many peasants informants, got the locations of the plantations and caused huge damage to the Sinaloa wheat producers. For example, in August 1982, in one of these raids, 200 acres of land had more than 400 tons of sinsemia wheat got destroyed. This was a huge blow to Guadalajara. In sum, Mariana was ungrateful effort and the profits did not worth the risk. Thus, for Mexicans, cocaine was what the doctor ordered. From now on, production wasn't their problem, and the product they were to sell had a way higher margin of profit. At this time, Medellin pilots like Barry Seal who smuggled Colombian coke from South America to the US were getting arrested and their routes were out of function. A former commercial pilot, Seal was an American who carried Escobar's cocaine from Colombia to the US, but he was arrested by the DAA and became an informant. Reasons like these made Mexicans sensible partners for Colombian cartels. And once this cooperation began, Mexicans enabled fields in Mexico to harbor Colombian planes. For example, in Yucatan state, 40 acres of land was made a shipment point for Colombian pilots. The cocaine arriving here was later to be shipped into the United States via smaller planes that could flew under the radar. Also, there were many terrestrial routes in Mexico, such as towns bordered California, Arizona, Texas, etc. And there was a reason why the United States didn't fully intervene with this new arrangement. The main reason was CIA, who used people like Barry Seal to support counter-guerrilla operations in Nicaragua by making him carry CIA weapons to the guerrillas. Allegedly, Rafael Caro Quintero was also helping CIA efforts by allowing his Veracruz ranches to be used by Guatemalan guerrillas as training camps. So the earlier smugglers were somehow key players for CIA's counter-guerrilla efforts. Meanwhile, Felix Gallardo eliminated another big player in Mexican drug business, Alberto Sicilia Falcón. Falcón took part in the Cuban Revolution, but somehow fell from grace and escaped the regime. As a result, he became an arms dealer, providing weapons for anti-communist groups in Latin America, probably backed by CIA. Felix Gallardo first offered Falcón a partnership, but at some point the two had a disagreement and Felix Gallardo got Falcón arrested and put behind the bars. As a person, Felix Gallardo was a family man, being a cold-blooded and calculating businessman. He had a hands-on approach, spending most of his time with negotiations and organizing. Always having close ties with politics, Gallardo was named El Padrino, the godfather thanks to these qualities. Another alias that he had was El Jefe de Jefes, simply meaning boss of the bosses in Spanish. Gallardo also had a class, bought Italian designer shoes, suits and etc. As well as some sports cars he loved. But besides all these, he tried to maintain a humble image. He had a ranch at the outskirts of Culiacan, which was also a modest place compared to many future cartel bosses who had grandois mansions. He didn't wear most of the expensive watches he bought, all these were precautions not to attract too many attention. With all these qualities and business-oriented mindset, Felix Gallardo set an example for the ones like El Chapa Guzman who would be the bosses in the future. According to this new deal with the Colombians, the half of the cocaine shipped to Mexico was to be kept by Guadalajara cartel as a payment. And around this time, the organization was finally described as the Guadalajara cartel earning $5 billion annually. Besides, Felix Gallardo was still pushing the marijuana produced by Caro and Don Nato via the routes he used for Colombian cocaine, further increasing his profits. At this point, something that seemed unimportant but shaped the future of Mexican underworld took place. Don Nato's nephew, Don Nato's nephew, the future Lord of the Skies, Amado Carrillo Fuentes, had an argument with Caro Quintero, whose girlfriend was somehow attracted to Amado. In order to avoid a bloody fight, Amado's uncle Don Neto sent Amado away from Guadalajara to the border town of Chihuahua, Oyenaga, near Pablo Acosta Villarreal. Here, Amado learned the specifics of the drug smuggling business from the complete old-school narco-trafficante Pablo Acosta, and he was to fill the shoes of Gallardo, El Jefe de Jefes, in the future. In the 80s, Reagan was the president in the United States and he launched the war on drugs in countries like Colombia. As Medellin cartels started bleeding under pressure, Mexican cartels became more and more important in the cocaine trade, having more responsibility and authority within time. The business was going fine for Sinaloans until February 7, 1985. 
because at this time was the time when a DIA agent, Kiki Camarena, who was the name behind many raids and destruction of Guadalajara cartel's Mariana business, got kidnapped on broad daylight. The main perpetrators of the kidnapping were Caro Quintero and Don Nato, whose businesses got suffered the worst because of Camarena's operations. Especially Caro was a key player in Mariana business. By the 1982, he was no more than 24 but managed to control Mariana fields which employed more than 20,000 farmers. Caro was a flamboyant gangster who was also popular with women, a quality that gave him the nickname The Prince. And the old lieutenant Don Neto favored Caro even more than his nephew Amado and kept him close instead of Amado when the two young guys had a beef with one another. And now the two had problem with the Camarena and they met at a birthday party of a common friend where they pondered about their common problem, the operations led by Camarena, whose name was not known to them yet. The two decided to kidnap this official who was raiding their fields and put some fear in him to just make him leave Jalisco. Although killing state officials and even US officials was to become a common practice for cartels, at this time it was one of the most important unwritten laws of the Mexican underworld. Gringos, the US officials, were especially to be left untouched. Don Neto and Caro did such kidnappings before to shoo away some local cops from Jalisco state. So now they were to use the same tactic with Kiki Camarena whose name wasn't known to them at this time. And El Jefe de Jefes did not know about this plot in the beginning. At this point you can ask the question why would they care so much about Mariana if they have Colombian cocaine being sold in the United States for way higher prices. But the thing is guys, this is not like uh, American mafia where you have the boss and you have the captains and you have the certain regimes. No, here in the Mexican cartels, especially at this time, there are routes, plazas they're called, and these plazas were controlled by small players. And each small player is in charge of these routes uh, by themselves along. So the boss is kind of like a supervisor of the business negotiations between uh, Mexicans and Colombians and for the rest of the business each plaza owner is responsible for the profit that he makes. So the thing is Don Nato and Caro Quintero are in charge of their own Mariana routes. So they are heavily involved in Mariana and this is their like a bread and butter. So maybe the cocaine is being sold in via different routes. These guys are more like responsible with Mariana business rather than cocaine business. And they're also heavily into the production of Mariana, especially Caro Quintero. So Kiki Camarena is making a huge problem for especially for these two guys. So they really want to get rid of this guy. At least at this point, they want to put some fear into him. But as we will see, this will cause even a bigger problem for the entire Guadalajara cartel. For example, a more than 100 million square feet Rancho Buffalo plantation was raided by 450 Mexican soldiers, destroying an $8 million worth source of income just with one bust. Such severe blows made Caro and Don Nato take action. Camarena issue was almost personal for the duo and the two got Jalisco's governor, police captains and officers in their pockets. They reached out to a cartel associate working in the US consulate to identify the leading person behind the operations, a DEA agent named Kiki Camarena. On the 7th of February, Camarena got kidnapped by the cartel's goons on a broad daylight taken to a cartel apartment. On the day of the incident, Felix Gallardo somehow learned about the whole thing and went to meet Caro and Don Nato outside the apartment they kept Camarena. Before the cartel started torturing him, they learned the crucial information from Camarena. According to this information, his operation mainly targeted Felix Gallardo, the second target being Caro and the third Don Nato. And this operation was based on the cocaine that was seized by the DIA in Texas and New Mexico belonging personally to Felix Gallardo. After hearing all these, Gallardo panicked and wanted to personally interrogate Camarena to learn more about what they had against himself. Don Nato, fearing for what was about to happen, left Camarena to Caro's supervision and left the area. Of course, DAA was alarmed, but they couldn't find Kiki's whereabouts. This was certainly an unacceptable thing for the United States. Even though he was a Mexican-born person, Kiki was an American citizen working for a DAA, an American agency. Therefore, the US didn't leave anything to luck and put pressure on everybody possible, including the president of Mexico, Miguel de la Madrid. 
from Mexican Federal Police to the Interpol in Mexico, every law enforcement agency joint Operation Lyanda, the greatest murder investigation in DAA's history. Not trusting any Mexican officials, now the gringos were on the field, personally searching for Kiki, whose dead body was finally found covered in canvas in the outskirts of Michoacan. Kiki was heavily tortured before his death. Holes were drilled into his skull and his ribs were all broken. Normally, the figures like Caro were key in anti-communist operations of CIA, but Kiki's murder, which also got carried to the cover of Times magazine, became something that even CIA could not let pass. But surprisingly, this wasn't the first time Caro Quintero murdered US citizens. Because allegedly, Caro killed two Americans days ago who were present at a restaurant he was eating at. Caro took the two four American agents and killed them after torturing. One of them was an aspiring novelist John Clay Walker and the other was a student of a faculty of dentistry Albert Radelat. Caro got the two men taken to the back of the restaurant, tortured them with ice picks and buried them somewhere outside the restaurant. But Kiki's murder was not like that and it changed everything. Caro Quintero got captured in April 4, 1985 in his Costa Rica mansion and got sent back to Mexico. He was sentenced with 40 years for murder. After a couple of days in April 7, Don Nato got captured by Mexican army in his villa in Jalisco. Nato did not approve what Caro did to Camarena, and the two had a standoff pulling their guns at each other, and at the end Nato left Caro's house, but nonetheless Mexico charged Nato with murder, giving him 40 years in prison. The third accomplice, Felix Gallardo, avoided capture for the time being thanks to the greater protection he received from Mexican high authorities due to the money he controlled. He was still untouchable. But of course gringos were going after him with everything they got and he was on the top of the wanted list of the United States. The days of El Padrino were numbered. Felix Gardo moved himself and his family to Guadalajara in order to avoid capture hiring houses for his family and his mistress. Feeling the increasing pressure on himself, Felix Gardo decided to split his operation, replacing a top-down organization style with a more untraceable one. He was a primary target for the US after Camarena murder. But according to his theory, in a scenario where he delegated his power, both himself and his underlings would be harder to catch, and thus trade would be protected. Also, the middlemen would be able to buy out the politicians and police, further guaranteeing their protection against the US. In short, El Padrino's new strategy was to hedge his bets. Thus, this new organization of the Guadalajara cartel was going to give birth to the most dominant cartels of the future years. El Padrino held a big meeting at Acapulco, a coastal town of Mexico, and split the plazas among his lieutenants. According to this split, Tijuana, a border city to California, was given to Ariano Felix brothers. One of the most valuable plazas, the city of Juarez that borders Texas, was given to Amado Correa Fuentes and his brothers. Juarez was originally a coastal territory, but he was killed in 1987 during a shootout with police. Miguel Quintero, the brother of the imprisoned Caro Quintero, got Sonora, the south of Arizona. And the heart of Marian and Poppy Field, Sinaloa, was given to El Chapo Guzman and his partner El Mayo Zambada. They were to lead the Pacific Ocean routes and cooperate with one of the old players who had a long dispute with El Padrino, Palma Salazar, aka El Guerrero. While the split happened, El Padrino made clear that he wanted no problem with the Gulf Cartel and their, ter and their territories were to left undisturbed. Of course, El Padrino was to run the entire thing at the top, but now his powers were delegated. Of course, El Padrino was to run the entire thing from the top, but now his powers were delegated. And as a result, each plaza owner slowly started to build up his own empire. Intending to took the heat off of himself, Felix Gallardo delegated the routes, plazas among different players. Thus, he makes local players semi-autonomous, sharing the responsibility and burdens he once had alone. And thus, he no longer needs to micromanage everything. But this split was to give birth to famous Mexican cartels such as Tijuana Cartel, Juarez Cartel, Sinaloa Cartel, and so on. At this point, let's talk about death of Pablo Acosta, a legendary narco. The common belief was that he got set up by Guillermo González Calderoni, a federal police. No matter how much Acosta paid him, Calderoni somehow wanted to eliminate Pablo Acosta. Calderoni was closely working with Felix Gallardo, so one can ask the question if El Padrino wanted to eliminate this influential figure, but we don't know exactly why. 
After Acosta's demise, Juarez was ruled by his right-hand man, an ex-federal cop, Rafael Aguilar Guardo, who was to be killed by Amado later. But for a while, they coexisted and ruled Juarez together. Just like El Padrino, Amado had a great vision. He left Juarez for a while and went to the inner parts of the northern Mexico, Torreon City. Here, he created a squadron of aircrafts comprised of Sabreliner, Learjet and Cessna, some of the famous plane models of the era. With these and more, Amado was to become El Señor de los Cielos, the Lord of the Skies. Amado's luck turned in April 8, 1987, when Felix Gallardo got arrested at Guadalajara while having a lunch with Calderoni, a corrupt cop who was supposed to work for him at the time. He was set up at Calderoni's house by federal agents. After this, Felix Gallardo was to spend rest of his life behind bars. According to El Padrino, the setup was totally on Calderoni. But the reason behind this plot is still a matter of debate. One of the main theories was that Calderoni, who was from Tamaulipas, the seat of Gulf Cartel, arrested Gallardo on the behalf of the Gulf Cartel. An element backing this theory is the fact that the president of Mexico at the time, Salinas, had close ties to the Gulf Cartel via his father, who was friends with the Gulf bosses. As a result, El Jefe de Jefes was behind bars. Just like Caro and Don Nato, he received 40 years for murder, but was able to remain effective from prison until 1993, the year that he got transferred to a high security prison, causing him all his ties to the outside world. In 2017, he received an additional 37 years after 28 years in prison. Gallardo is still serving time in prison up to this day. After Gallardo, Amado Carrillo Fuentes was to dominate the 90s of Mexican underworld, but split among the cartels was gonna get stronger each day. But we will talk about both Amado and El Chapo Guzman in the following episodes. Thank you for watching and your time. Yo sigo cantando